Behold, a dragon! Wait, what? That's a dragon? <sighs> Behold, a... Where is it? Ah! Behold! Wow, so dragons have been everywhere for a long time. Africa, Europe, Asia, South America, North America, Australia, Middle East, Antarctica. Fine, maybe not Antarctica. They're in the Bible, 21 times, played by Satan himself. They're in the roughly 3,000 year old Indian Sanskrit text, the Rig Veda, as the embodiment of drought. And China's been depicting them as wise, watery protectors for the last five millennia. I've done some digging into how a made-up creature can find its way onto almost every continent. Yes, they flew. Very good. And now today, we're seeing a new era in fantasy, expecting a particular and refined design from dragons out of all the many candidates through the centuries. We're seeing that dragon design on our TV screens today with HBO's House of the Dragon averaging 29 million viewers every episode. And everything just left me wondering why now? What? brought on this modern age of dragons. I'm very grateful to be joined today by Tony DiTalisi, who is the co-author and illustrator of The Spiderwick Chronicles. Growing up in the 1970s, dinosaurs were incredibly popular, and I don't think a love of an extinct animal that no one has ever seen in the flesh, that's gigantic, that could eat us, that's not a big leap to consider that dragons were probably also once real. And then when you get older, you start to realize you know, things like griffins and unicorns and dragons uh, were creatures of mythology. And that was such a bummer. Tony's not alone. Dinosaur fossils and large animal bones have been credited to dragons in the past, like 13th century Poland's Wawel dragon, whose bones hanging outside a cathedral are definitely just whale bones. Chinese historian Chang Chu looked a fossilized Stegosaurus in the 4th century BCE and said, yeah, that's a dragon. To be fair to the guy, there were armored plates and spikes. In his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Dragons of Eden, renowned scientist Carl Sagan argues, our belief in dragons comes from an evolutionary need to combine reality with our imagination while we're overcoming you know, all the real world threats like reptiles and big cats and fire. All the different descriptions of each culture's dragon are linked to our prehistoric predators. The head of a crocodile, the scales and sometimes torso of a snake or a lizard, the wings of an eagle or a bat. All these animals have been found in every continent except Antarctica. Yes, Antarctica, what is even over there? Peng penguins, great. But just because they're found all over the world, except Antarctica, doesn't mean they don't have their slight differences. The Chinese dragon has the face of a camel, for example. Visually, when you say the word dragon, I think a lot of us think of the European typical kind of dinosaur shaped dragon that has four legs and also a pair of wings, or the front legs have been replaced with wings like a bat. It's very different than the Eastern mythologies and the Asian mythologies where the dragons are more serpentine and usually don't have wings. Through the 18th and 19th centuries, as literacy around the world increased, demand in Europe for more than just the Bible led booksellers to print copies of popular ballads and folklores to improve business. And what features in both the Bible and folk mythology? Yeah, dragons. By the 20th century, scholars of European mythology, authors like J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, brought the distinctly European dragon mythology into modern fantasy fiction. While in China, the dragon continued to be a national symbol of benevolent power and control of water. The European fantasy novels directly inspired the dragons of the modern age, like Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, Reign of Fire, and much, much more. Meanwhile, Asia's benevolent protector dragon can be seen in a very different light in films like Shang-Chi, Mulan, and the animated series Avatar The Last Airbender. That continued to thrive for the last 20 years, so it didn't surprise me that Game of Thrones would become so popular because those are the kids who grew up reading Harry Potter and fantasy. So of course they love Game of Thrones. Who wouldn't love Game of Thrones? But now we've got something that would make our ancestors shudder with fear. Really good CGI. It now has the capability to render dragons in a much more realistic way than ever before. As a result, artists have gone full circle, drawing from reality to perfect the dragon's likeness. Designers for Marvel's Shang-Chi watch sea snakes and iguanas to influence the dragon's movements, while House of the Dragon goes the extra mile for realness. Iguana. Iguana. Say it again. Say it as you would. Iguana. 
All right. Ig igua iguana. It's all in the details. Flies buzzing around to give a sense of the smell coming off of these things. All 17 of these dragons have distinct colors, likened to bearded dragons, just as George R. R. Martin imagined for them. The filmmakers can look at natural history videos, so say a lion that's just made a kill, and they can incorporate elements of that, like the flies or maybe blood on the muzzle and things like that, that can just make it that much more uh, believable to, to the viewer. Dragons have taken on so many different forms in our collective imagination. And the depiction we've landed at today, the bat-winged, fire-breathing, sometimes intelligent, always deadly, mega-beast, is as real as we've ever seen. Something you know, we can really believe in. We all have built our societies upon stories. It is such a part of who we are as a global community, and I think there'll always be room for monsters, and there'll certainly always be room for dragons. Except for this freaky Macaulay Culkin looking one. And this one making out with its prey. Ugh. Oh, this one's kind of cute. You can stay. Hey, that one's not even a dragon. That one's pretty cool. I don't understand this one. Gross. Oh, this one's one of yours, Tony. Oh, Macaulay Culkin again.